This is True Crime Arizona, an Arizona's Family Originals podcast. Hi, everybody. Brianna Whitney here, host of the True Crime Arizona podcast. I am joined for this episode by our weekend anchor and reporter, Emma Lockhart. So, Emma, you were on the podcast last time we gave a big investigative update on where we're at with the Preston Lord death investigation. He was a 16-year-old who was killed, uh, beaten to death at a Halloween party in Queen Creek back on October 28th. That's when the party was. He died a couple days later. And during that podcast episode, we learned that charges were submitted to the county attorney from the Queen Creek Police Department. We're waiting for what's going to happen with those charges. But we touched on in that episode this rash of East Valley teen violence that's been going on. Mm -hmm. Preston Lord's death investigation really was the catalyst for reopening cases, for looking deeper into cases. A lot of parents, the community coming forward and said, hey, there's a problem here, and it is all being referred to as a group called the Gilbert Goons. Even Gilbert Police has referred to them as such. Some people have said they are a gang. That is not proven yet. But when we last left our podcast listeners and viewers with the latest, these charges were just submitted in Preston Lord's investigation to the county attorney, and Gilbert Police, I believe, was only investigating four instances. That's right. Today... A huge update in really this entire East Valley violence saga that is unfolding and has been top of mind for so many people in the Valley. Today alone, there have been five arrests in East Valley violence attacks, not the Preston Lord investigation, but other attacks that Gilbert Police and the Pinal County Sheriff's Office have been investigating. I want to take people through these attacks, what we know, who's been arrested, which incidents we're talking about, and then I'm going to bring in Emma for some analysis because you've been working on one of these cases specifically. So the first the first attack It was at a Gilbert in and out. This was back in August, August 18th, 2023. There's video of this attack. The Gilbert Police Department has put out pictures, still pictures of that video. So we knew that there was evidence in this case. A lot of people have been zeroing in on the in and out as being this hub for a lot of this East Valley violence. We learned today Gilbert Police has have arrested two adults and two teens in this case. 18-year-old Christopher Fantastic was one of the arrests, and 18-year-old Aris Arredondo was the other in terms of the adults. We also know there are two unnamed 16-year-olds who were arrested. I know I said this happened in August, but it was a robbery and aggravated assault of a teen outside of a Gilbert In-N-Out. That In-N-Out is at Williams Field Road and Santan Village Parkway. Fantastic's bail was set at 25000 today in court. And during that court proceeding, the state argued that he's linked to several teen violence incidents with what they called, quote, a group the defendant belongs to. The judge then went on to say in this specific incident, she does not have enough information to link him to the, quote, gang of kids based on information from police. The term Gilbert Goons was not explicitly set in court with Fantastic's case. That is different when it comes to this Pinal County attack. So this is the second one that the arrests that we're learning about an arrest in. November 18th, 2023, there was a fight in the desert near Wagon Wheel Road and Sundance Drive in Santan Valley. The 16-year-old victim had minor injuries, but there is video of this attack. And this was PCSO investigating this because it was in an unincorporated part of Queen Creek. Today around 7 a.m., the Pinal County Sheriff's Office arrested 20-year-old Jacob Pennington from Gilbert. The court paperwork says he actually admitted to being associated with a group called the Gilbert Goons and said that name originated from a Snapchat group. That was interesting because that is the first time we have heard any of the alleged perpetrators in these attacks actually mention the Gilbert Goons or claim to be associated with them. That attack was caught on camera. You can actually see Jacob hitting the victim or allegedly see Jacob hitting the victim in the face, yelling racial slurs, taking his belt off and then hitting the victim some more. Jacob claims he was defending a girl who he says the victim hit. But Jacob also has prior charges, two DUIs, driving on a suspended license and a minor in consumption charge. A quick note on that case, Jacob's brother, Noah Pennington, was arrested in Mesa on December 28th for a felony warrant 
That was an outstanding warrant for previous charges involving narcotics and misconduct involving weapons. Those two instances are separate, but both brothers recently arrested for problems in the East Valley. So we were now able to at least connect the fact that they are related. They live together. Um, before we go into the Preston Lord investigation, this is obviously a lot of information for people to digest today. And it felt like Emma from, from 8 a.m. today all through just a couple hours ago, it was like every hour on the hour, we're learning more information. There's another arrest. There's somebody new. Okay. Now PCSO is involved. Gilbert police is involved. It's hard to keep up. It, but everybody is is waiting for more and more and more. So people were kind of on the edge of their seats all day. In the Gilbert in and out attack, I want to bring you in because you actually talked to the dad of the victim in this attack. You've talked to him before. Mm -hmm. Tell me about that interview and just what he's feeling tonight, knowing that four people have been arrested in his son's attack. Mm -hmm. So I talked with Richard Keener a couple of weeks ago at the walk for Preston Lord. And at the time, there were no arrests in connection with his son's case. Um, so there was certainly a lot of relief today. Um, I interviewed him after we learned that that 18-year-old Christopher Fantastic uh, was arrested and is facing charges in connection with his son's case. Uh, so yeah, a lot of relief, but still a lot of frustration because it took so long for suspects to be arrested. And he feels like the only reason his case was reopened, his son's case was reopened, and other cases on teen violence here in the Valley is because of public pressure and because of media coverage on these assaults that have been happening, these rash of teen assaults that have been happening over the past couple of months and even spanning years. Right. Um, this was not the first time his son was attacked. So take a listen to what he had to say, his initial reactions learning about the arrest. I had an emotion here that, that I was glad, but then all of a sudden the emotion went back there because I was very pissed that it took so long for that to happen when they had this information back in August. Why did it take that long? Why was my case closed? And then all of a sudden reopened, and now this happened. So very frustrating. If there was no media attention or the community wasn't getting involved, this would have been just swept under the rug, and these kids would continue to be doing this. I'm positive of that. That was interesting because so many parents have said to me and probably said to you too, they feel that these cases have been swept under the rug mm -hmm. by both the city of Gilbert and the Gilbert Police Department and really just a blind eye turned to the fact that this is going on and why did it take a death to actually reignite these cases to be investigated or reopened in the first place? That's what we've heard a lot from parents. Um, interesting because he was talking about uh, the, the media attention on this. And, you know, he, this case is in Gilbert. Last night, Gilbert had, the city of Gilbert had a council meeting and they discussed and voted to create a subcommittee to actually address these teen violence incidents. Um, the Gilbert police chief was there. He didn't say a whole lot. He basically acknowledged the fact that they had upped the cases they were investigating from eight to nine. Somebody had come forward from a November 2022 attack. So they were looking at that now. It was previously unreported. But when it comes to the Gilbert police chief, does he feel, does the victim's dad feel supported by the police department? Does he feel good about the fact that there was a step taken to move forward last night? He has mixed feelings about it. You know, talking about the subcommittee and what happened last night with them forming the subcommittee, he definitely feels like it's a little too late and they're behind on this. And he's worried about future attacks on teens in, in the Valley and in the East Valley specifically. So there's definitely still a lot of frustration and anger. And he says he specifically has emailed the police chief directly and has not heard back. And a lot of his frustration comes from the fact that he says his son, this is not the first time his son was attacked, this incident on August 18th. He says there have been several other attacks that go back two years that he reported to the Gilbert Police Department and school leaders. And so that's why he's so angry and wants to know why these 
attacks and these threats and incidents were not taken seriously. There's no excuse for it. And I want answers, you know, from the police chief you know, on why they didn't take these threats seriously. I've been presenting these two years ago. This isn't new. This is the third time my son's been attacked. And, it, and each time I've brought it to the, the school principals and the Gilbert Police Department. So for, for them to say they didn't know about the Gilbert goons or this stuff, I, that's not true because I'm, I know I personally presented that to him. He still has nightmares. You know, he wakes up, um, you know, re, reliving what happened. Um, you know, I think his self-esteem is hurt. You know, he, uh, he asked the other day if he could get plastic surgery to fix the scar on his lip because every time he sees it, it reminds him of that. But your heart just breaks for this 16-year-old yeah. victim and his family. Um, he says it's had such an impact on him psychologically. He's currently in therapy. And after this most recent assault, he was so traumatized and so worried about his own safety that the father decided to send him to live with his mom who lives overseas. So that's where he's been this entire time. Again, going through therapy. Physically, he's okay. But... Mentally, he's not. And even before this last assault, um, the father says that after the first one, that he ended up changing schools. And there's just always been this fear. And allegedly, this was in the court hearing that we heard um, earlier today, the court hearing for that suspect, uh, fantastic, that the reason these suspects attacked the 16-year-old outside of the In-N-Out was because he reported threats to school authorities. So you're, I mean, he's doing the right thing by reporting and, and they're allegedly retaliating against him. And the fact that it was so, so bad that he actually moved out of the country, just uh, it, the magnitude of that mm -hmm. is upsetting. And I can imagine why his, his dad is so upset and frustrated by the lack of action until now. Yeah, and that's why he's been so willing to speak out and do interviews and go to these walks and go to these meetings because he not only wants justice for his son's case, but also the other cases out there. Gilbert PD again reopening at least nine cases involving teen violence after really the uproar from from the community. Right, right. And I know he was in the military at one point and kind of described the emotional turmoil that he's experienced with that versus what he's seen his son go through. Yeah, he was. And we have some uh, sound on just his reaction, his initial reaction after his son came home after that alleged assault. I was in the military, I'm a veteran, and I've, I've been in two wars, and I've seen a lot of things overseas that I wish I never would have seen. And, but nothing compares to the night my son came home bloodied, and I, I just couldn't, you know, the, it was just horrible. I can't even describe it. I think the best task force or the best subcommittee to have is us parents and the community, all those people that were there, because uh, we'll get results. Interesting he said that. I found covering the Gilbert City Council meeting last night that there was mixed emotions from people about the subcommittee being formed. It was a unanimous vote, six to zero to create it, but a lot of people felt, one, this should have already been done and that a subcommittee isn't the, really going to fix a whole lot. They want to know bullet points. What's the subcommittee going to do? Who's going to be on it? When should they have an idea of, of a plan moving forward? Um, and, and none of that really came out of the meeting last night. I think a lot of them felt that it was a lot of talk from the council members. Some of them felt they were heartfelt. Others felt that it was kind of a show. Um, but I think the, the moral of this story overall is the amount of pressure that the parents and the community has put on these officials and these police departments to do something about this, it has really made a difference. And because of brave people like him mm -hmm. and his son and, and the people coming forward, that does seem to be the reason why a lot of, the, a lot of these cases are being reopened or investigated, maybe at all. 
Yeah, I agree. And he believes that too, you know, and that's why he's continuing to speak out uh, to put pressure on the Gilbert Police Department and also, you know, the Queen Creek Police Department. Mm -hmm. um, and they're all waiting to see what happens in the Preston Lord case. Obviously, that's high profile as well. And that's really what started all of this. You know, we, we saw the attack on Preston and then one by one, people started coming out saying there has been so much teen violence that hasn't been reported. And all of a sudden you started to see it blow up, not only in terms of people speaking out and the media getting involved, but even just people in the community posting on TikTok and social media. I mean, all eyes were on these incidents and, and these alleged Gilbert goons as they're being referred to by the Gilbert Police Department and people in the community as this group of teens that does these attacks. Preston Lord, 16 years old, a terrible death at the end of October, beaten to death. And among a lot of these teen violence council meetings and things like that, you see a sea of people wearing orange shirts. That is all to support Preston Lord. And so today, for the, for a, the first time in a, a while now, Maricopa County attorney Rachel Mitchell addressed where the Preston Lord murder investigation stands. And to catch people up, Queen Creek was the original or lead police agency that was on this case investigating his death. They did ask the FBI to come in and assist. Um, there, it, it went for two months with nothing. And that's where parents started to get really angry and frustrated. How are there hundreds of kids that have cell phone pictures and videos and things, but there's nothing being done. At that two month mark is when Queen Creek submitted the charges for seven people, both adults and kids, to the Maricopa County Attorney's Office to review, and then the County Attorney's Office will determine what those charges are. Today at the press conference, Rachel Mitchell gave a little bit of background into how the process works when charges are submitted. And you do hear that a lot. Why aren't arrests just made? Mm -hmm. The Queen Creek Police Department wants those extra eyes from the County Attorney's Office, but they actually described it and called it a basket submittal. I didn't know exactly what that meant, and I don't think a lot of people do. Basically, that kind of submittal with charges gives them extra time to fully review it without putting a time frame on you must prosecute or decide on these charges in a certain amount of time. If they're dealing with something where it's somebody's already in custody and arrested and they're deciding or determining whether those charges will go through, in that case, they have 48 hours to decide. In this case, there is no time limit. They are allotted that time to review the case. So that's what's going on with this one. But in terms of evidence, we are talking thousands of pieces of evidence. And so I want to start by just playing you some of the some of the press conference today where Rachel Mitchell's talking about exactly where Preston Lord's murder investigation stands now. We exchange evidence with the Queen Creek Police Department through um, evidence.com and we have over 2000 pieces of evidence. That could include pictures, that could include interviews, body worn cams, other videos. But as you can imagine, 2,000 pieces of evidence is a lot to go through. 2,000 pages of a police report is a lot to go through. Over 600 of those pieces of evidence are videos. All of those videos have to be watched by the prosecutors who are assigned. I have assigned two senior prosecutors from this office who are homicide prosecutors. They are experienced at what they do and they are pouring through this evidence. But understand, to take it to the probable cause hearing, we not only have to present evidence that supports our case, but we have to present evidence that contradicts our case as well. So we have to have it right, and we have to have it right the first time. We are going to move as quickly as possible, but we are not going to let expediency uh, take priority uh, over doing it right. So this will take time, as you can imagine, because we all want the right outcome and we all want to see justice for press. And I know that public pressure is high and people are expecting results quickly. What I would say to the public is this is not my first rodeo. Um, I'm a 30 year prosecutor and I know how to put a case together and we're not going to compromise quality. 
interesting. She's very aware yeah. of the immense pressure that this community has and is putting on that office right now to do something and to take action and to decide on these charges. Um, and you heard her say right there, this isn't my first rodeo. I mean, she she wants the public to know they are doing this and that they plan on doing this Right. Because yeah. if they mess it up, they really only have one shot to get these charges correct with how they feel they have the best shot at prosecuting them. And you heard her talk about a probable cause meeting or a probable cause hearing. Um, that's where they will present their evidence. They'll go to the probable cause phase of that and then they'll mm -hmm. actually file the charges. So um, it's it's a lot of behind the scenes process that just a lot of people don't see. Mm -hmm. And I think they wanted to kind of bring that to the forefront saying, hey, we are going through this. It is high priority. It is top priority. But this is how it works um, in terms of just how we get to from point A to point B to actually file those charges. Interestingly enough, in all of not all of these, but in, in most of these attacks, the M.O. is that the perpetrators take video of the attacks and then they're sharing them or they're posting them, things like that. It's it's hor horrible mm -hmm. and it's they're hard to watch. But we've seen them now in so many incidents, many of the ones that these police agencies and sheriff's departments are investigating. So I wanted to ask Rachel Mitchell something about videos in the Preston Lord investigation. Of the 600 videos or so that you have in evidence, is there video of the actual attack on Preston Lord? I'm not going to comment on that. Short, mm -hmm. sweet to the point. It, you, you would assume that there likely is some sort of video of that, but maybe the kids turned off their phones at that point. Maybe mm -hmm. they're working with everything leading up and then everything leading out of that, we, we just don't, don't know. know. And we were hoping to get some answers on that um, because it's those moments that unfortunately, the fact that they are filmed, they serve as the best pieces of evidence to show what exactly what happened. Yeah, I mean, they're doing a lot of interviews too. And, and you, you hope and we assume that there are so many witnesses to his murder. But in the end, physical video of what happened is going to serve as very strong evidence in these cases. So Absolutely. I think those 600 videos are some of the, the best pieces of evidence of that 2000. And you just think about teen kids, everyone has a cell phone and you can only imagine that maybe something like that would be recorded and that they have that kind of concrete evidence, but yeah, still unclear. And you also have possibly ring doorbell cameras or surveillance cameras, things like that on houses nearby that could have picked up who was coming, who was going and when. Yeah, that could also be part of that too. We hope that will become more clear. Um, we may not even learn that even when they filed the charges. That's something that could eventually come out in a trial setting. Mm. The Gilbert Goons. I feel like we say that and there's just so much weight with, with that phrase. Um, it is what Gilbert Police is referring to this group of teens, and it's what the community is also referring to as this group of teens. The big question now is, are they are they connected or involved in this rash of East Valley violence? The community believes they are. The police departments are investigating if they are. But the, the biggest question of all is if these Gilbert goons, these alleged goons, are involved or, or responsible for Preston Lord's death. And it becomes very important with the murder investigation because if the Gilbert goons are deemed a criminal street gang by legal definition in Arizona, then that would change the type of charges that the perpetrators could face in this case. And so I asked Rachel Mitchell about it and when we would learn if and when they would deem the Gilbert goons as a criminal street gang. Will you or your office release whether or not the alleged Gilbert goons are considered a criminal street gang before you say whether you are submitting or prosecuting those charges? That would come at the same time or shortly thereafter, as, as you know, the um, there are two ways that the street gang comes up. One is as a separate charge, which obviously would be charged at the same time. The other is as uh, an aggravating factor, or I'm sorry, an enhancement, and uh, that would be filed uh, contemporaneously. So those extra charges, if it was a criminal street gang, you would announce at that same time? Yes. Okay. Unless, you know, 
as information becomes available, things could change. Would there be more information that would become available after announcing Preston Lord, as opposed to the information you already have <coughs> with evidence that's relating to these team? You know, from what I hear, every time that there's, you know, significant coverage on this case, that more people do contact the police, which is great. Um, and we're not going to turn off the faucet if there's more information. Interesting that she made note of that, because I think people are looking at this and, and they they see that she has said, OK, nothing has changed in terms of nobody's been ruled out in Preston Lord's murder investigation. But at the same time, nobody has been added to those seven people who they were recommending charges for. Mm -hmm. Clearly, if the Maricopa County Attorney's Office learns more, they are not afraid to add charges, whether that's more charges to one of the people already being investigated or other people who were involved that night. And it does feel the more that we learn about the amount of attacks that are out there that are being investigated and now the amount of arrests that came down. I mean, so many in one day, they very well could learn more in Preston Lord's murder investigation. It, it is tough for the county attorney's office because you have the community who is really angry about these alleged Gilbert goons. And when you're coming from a legal standpoint, they have to look at this from a totality standpoint of what evidence do we have in this case that links just people to the crime itself? And then can we even call it a legal street gang? And so I asked her how their office is dealing with this whole Gilbert goons, terminology versus looking at the actual case when they're investigating Preston Lord's murder investigation. In terms of the, the Gilbert goons, mm -hmm. how is your office working with and around the fact that this is this is the name that's being thrown around by people in the community? They're using that to look at, hey, these may be linked. Gilbert Police is saying we are now looking at whether these assaults are related to a group called the Gilbert goons. How do you deal with that from a prosecutorial standpoint in terms of how you address the community who is who is upset and frustrated and angry at what's going on. And I understand that that's how people are referring to them. What I'm saying is I don't think it quite captures the seriousness of what we're dealing with here. Um, you know, it really doesn't matter to me what they call themselves or what people call them. What matters to me is what they did and what we can prove that they did. And that's what we're looking at. And that's exactly what, what they're going to do. You know, she's looking at this terminology, Gilbert goons, and she says it doesn't capture the seriousness of the situation. And you hear it and it doesn't. For the first time today, we've learned where that name may have originated just because of what was revealed in those court documents with the Pinal County attack, that this was a moniker used on a Snapchat group name. And that is easy to believe. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's pe teens, anybody's throwing around these words on social media left and right. Um, and so now we may have found the foundation of kind of, or maybe the, the birth of where this Gilbert Goons group or alleged group was born, Snapchat. Um, and so we had kind of wondered, you know, where, where did this come from, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so that's, that's where we stand with the Preston Lord murder investigation. Not a whole lot of new information. We know now the magnitude of everything that they're having to go through um, when it comes to evidence, when it comes to police reports. And a lot of those police reports, just from my experience going through lengthy police reports and murder investigations, a lot of that's going to be transcripts of interviews with people, whether that's teens that were there, whether that's parents, whether that's Preston Lord's family, to get the big picture of his life and the moments leading up to his attack and then what happened right after. Mm -hmm. So whenever we are able to see that police report, and I don't know when that will be, that will that will be extremely telling as to what's been going on behind the scenes with all of this. Absolutely. Again, seven people are under investigation with with the Preston Lord murder in terms of will they face any charges? There have been charges recommended from the Queen Creek Police Department to the county attorney's office for review. They are in the middle of that. They know it is high stakes. They know it is high profile, but they do have a lot to go through. And they would not, and we asked multiple times, 
would not give any sort of possible timeline as to when this would be wrapped up and when we would find out about it. Um, but it does seem that when we do find out about it, we'll also find out whether or not the Gilbert goons can be deemed a legal criminal street gang in Arizona. Um, Emma, final thoughts on today. This has been an exhausting day for everybody. Report From the reporting standpoint to the legal standpoint to the investigatory standpoint. I mean, there's just, there's, there's so much to this, but five arrests in one day and a press conference in possibly the most high profile murder case we have in Arizona right now. What's your take on the way that this has unfolded so far? You know, I think it's just important to keep talking with these parents and these families because their concerns are are real. Their fear Mm -hmm. is real. Just talking with this father, having to send his son overseas, the pain he's facing. I just think it's important to really listen to them, give them a platform, because obviously that is seems like has helped in this situation and in these investigations. And there's more justice that needs to to be done. Um, there's eight other cases right. that Gilbert Police is in investigating involving teen violence. So this is certainly not the end, I think. No. And we saw that grow so fast from four to eight to nine cases. So who's to say there couldn't be more cases that are added to that list as well? We just don't know. Um very important. The five people that were arrested, this is a start. The parents want to see so much more done. And this has really taken on so much more than just Queen Creek or Gilbert. This has really become an entire East Valley situation that everyone's paying attention to, to the point that the Chandler City Council is having a a meeting tomorrow and they are addressing what they can do about East Valley violence and trying to get ahead of it in their city because they know that there's so much crossover between the teens and the kids, whether that's schools or sports or just friendships. Um, There's a a lot that goes on in that kind of Chandler, Gilbert, Santan Valley, Queen Creek, Mesa, Mm -hmm. that whole area. um, Those kids really overlap. And so they're trying to get ahead of it as well. And I'm told that uh, Preston Lord's family is likely going to be there and that there may be um, so, some other people speaking out who were involved or had to ha- were involved with victims in these cases. And so we hope to learn more because as they share their stories and they come forward, that is so powerful in terms of fighting for action to be taken and fighting for justice in these cases. I think all of this grew a lot bigger than everybody thought it would or maybe expected it would come. Mm -hmm. But we will keep everybody updated here on the True Crime Arizona podcast. We felt there were so many updates that happened today just all day that we really needed to put out another comprehensive podcast that had every detail we know or at least can confirm on the record about who's been arrested, in what attack, what's being investigated, and what's to come. So we're hoping we'll have an update in the Preston Lord murder investigation in the near future. Um, We hope that we can give people that peace of mind that things are are being done. Um, But just know on our end as reporters and journalists, we hear you. We hear these communities. We are there Mm -hmm. reporting on them. We are going to the meetings. We are asking the questions from officials. And we know that this is something that so many people, parents and just community members in general care about. And we will continue asking the questions that that they have of the people who are in charge of these investigations. So Emma, thank you so much for coming on the podcast and your work on the case today. Um, and just in general, having, having that perspective from the parents themselves as one of these cases has unfolded. I appreciate it. Um, and we'll keep everybody updated as we learn more with the East Valley violence investigations. True Crime Arizona, the podcast, is hosted by me, Brianna Whitney, and produced by Sergio Hernandez. It's a production of Arizona's Family, 3TV, CBS5, and azfamily.com in Phoenix, Arizona. This is True Crime Arizona, an Arizona's Family Originals podcast. 